Okay, good morning, everybody. I want to uh, uh, express my condolences for those of you who haven't started your spring break already. <laughs> but we're going to have a very good time here today. We're going to continue reviewing the midterm uh, material, which will also be final exam material. And then I want to take about 15 minutes to look at this uh, film clip, part of a film on the uh, Judy Bari experience at Earth First. And probably in between those two, I'm going to ask John and I guess Sam to talk about the die-in a little bit, see how you experience it. Don't demonstrate it here, but just, just tell us about it. Uh, is there anyone who wanted to go to a discussion section but were not able to make the times? Okay, so we're going to put this in four, two piles? Yeah, sp spread it out, yeah. Okay, so then we, we have your exams here. They're alphabetical and they're in four piles, so I'm going to stop a little bit early. Let's see, Maria, you have to leave early. Come get your exam now. Or it should be right here. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm going to stop a little bit. If I forget, please tell me. That's, that's the signal. No, it's not. And we don't use that in this course. <laughs> um, so was there anyone who wanted to go to a discussion section and would be able to do it on Wednesday or Thursday afternoons, as not having been able to make it? Okay, Marcella. Hay otros, otras, Maria? Okay. Is that class? No, discussion section. Yeah. For this class. This uh, after spring break. Wednesday afternoons and Thursday afternoons. Or either Wednesday or Thursday. Would you, would you show of hands, who is either Wednesday at 4 p.m. or Thursday at 5 p.m.? Uh, raise your hand if you prefer Wednesday at 4 p.m. Okay. And how about Thursday at 5 p.m.? I think it's a little more on the Wednesday side, but I prefer that anyway. So okay. Wednesday And thank you, Matthew, because I know you're getting the same high level of compensation for your work in this course that I am. <laughs> Jenny? Where is the Oak Grove? Just, just follow the police barricades. You'll get there. <laughs> it's just in front of, of Memorial Football Stadium. So if you're going up Piedmont Avenue and I House is on your right, past I House, it's about half a block up on and soon we won't have to be ashamed of our small memorial stadium anymore, I, although I hope we actually will still be. Okay, so I think we were up to interpretation. And I was, yes, Matt, I'm sorry. Yeah, a brief announcement. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, just say like a show of hands, like who would be interested in going to the Tuesday and Thursday and stop by the summer if they were in the mouth? Yeah, this it's tomorrow night. 9 p.m.? Yeah, yeah, 9 p.m. Okay, good. And I won't be there, so I mean the lid's off. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll try and arrange another one later on that I can be at. Yeah. I'd like to do it. Picnic after spring break. Sounds like a good idea. Nonviolent picnic. <laughs> Every, everybody bring your little masks so you don't inhale flies and things like that. <laughs> good. So <laughs> we were talking about interpretation. And uh, Andrea, was it you that asked me to talk about it some more? You feel pretty sad? Okay, good. It's a good bridge, actually, to the next part of the semester because we're going to talk about changing the culture, changing the stories, how to get people to think differently. And my feeling has always been that that is a very, very efficient way to make change. And that it's uh, – when I said that the interpretation side <coughs> of the whole shift has been very weak, what I meant was that people get so caught up in the action that they forget the job of explaining to people what that action was and what it meant and how to understand it. 
And so now more than ever, that could be an extremely powerful leverage to bring about the change. In fact, when we have our open house for Meta, which you are all invited to on April 25th, we're going to have little – these sort of wallet-sized laminated cards that give you the nonviolent worldview on one side and the basic principles of nonviolent action on the other. So you can just carry that around in your wallet. As you're being arrested, you can whip it out. And a friend of mine saw part of the hearings yesterday with Al Gore and apparently there was a very interesting episode that took place that he was being attacked by a senator from a particular political party. Uh, who this senator has made himself be the point person for exposing the great lie of the liberal media that global warming is happening. And so he was not in a very comfortable position. And not being in a comfortable position, he was very nervous. What, you, what do you do when you're nervous? You attack people, right, unless you're nonviolent. So he was attacking f former Vice President Gore pretty uh, enthusiastically. And at one point, Al Gore said, Senator, I don't think I'm going to be able to explain my concerns to you, but why don't you and I – and he named a mutual friend that they have – why don't you, I, and mutual friend go out and have lunch and maybe I'll be able to get it across to you there. And immediately the senator, whose name I won't mention, calmed down. It was a real nonviolent interaction in Congress, probably first time since 1778. I think 1778, the first Congress meeting had to be canceled because of this lack of a quorum. But uh, ever since then, from then to now, I think that was probably the first time. So I felt very good about that. And that was, if you will, on a very small scale – I usually wouldn't use the term for this – but on a very small scale, you could call that a nonviolent moment because they're building up and building up and they're trying to resolve it. And finally, one person gets absolute clarity and the situation resolves in favor of the nonviolent person. But let's not use the term that casually. Usually it, re uh, it refers to a major campaign that's jostling and jostling and now it reaches a climax. Okay. So the next item was the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a.k.a. International Fellowship of Reconciliation. Just for your information, it was founded in 1914 when an Englishman and a German named Schultz were coming back from a meeting in uh, – probably in The Hague and they – got off the train in Cologne and they heard the news that the war had been declared. And they, in a very fa – in a famous moment, they, sh they stood facing each other on Bahnsteig 7 and Köln Bahnhof, this platform 7 of the Köln train station where I myself stood about three years ago, was had a moment of silence for this event. They shook hands and they said, we will never let this war separate us as friends. And that was the beginning of the Internationale Versöhnungsbund or the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. Now, why it shows up on your exam, there is something that is probably qualitatively different about the FOR as opposed to almost any other peace organization that might sh show up in our course. And that is that it has been around since 1914. The rest of the – I mean like I – mentioned to you Berkeley Students for Peace who performed an act of nonviolent interposition almost spontaneously and was very successful as most of them are. I think the tenure of the Berkeley Students for Peace was about four months. So now why am I making a fuss about the long duration of FOR? What's been one of the besetting problems in the peace movement? Catherine? Uh -huh. uh, they yeah. Set out to do, or they yes. Yeah, that's that's the big problem that uh, these movements, if if they are even movements and not just campaigns or uprisings, they arise in response to a problem, and they either solve the problem or they don't, and then they go home. And now there's a pro there's a difficulty with this, 
And that is that you have to reinvent the wheel every time there's a problem. And there's a tremendous advantage to continuity. And the peace movement has lacked continuity very badly. So because we have one organization that has been hanging in there for us, the other probably being the Society of Friends because it's been around for even longer. And though it is not a peace group specifically, it works on every aspect of peace development. But in terms of peace groups per se, I think IFOR <coughs> is probably the, the longest running peace game that we've got. And that helps. It's not just a number. It's not just a, something to put in the Ripley's Book of Records. It means that you learn stuff and you, you accumulate wisdom and you can improve as opposed to just constantly reinventing yourself. So one day the director of uh, FOR, um, US FOR, was on a train with somebody, fell into a casual conversation with this person, told him that he was part of FOR and they were looking for some office space. And the guy said, oh, take my house. And then he had this huge mansion on the banks of the Hudson in Nyack, New York, he was looking for somebody to donate it to. Gave it to this fellow saying, I, have, I went and visited there a few years ago and I was standing in the living room and there was a little three by five card on the mantelpiece. And I was looking at it. So Richard Dietz, who's my friend I was visiting, said, go ahead, have a look. So I picked it up and it was a, 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 an admission card. A, 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 so someone wanted to pay his money, subscription, that's what I'm looking for. Subscription to the FOR by a person named Martin Luther King Jr. with a $25 check <laughs> to join it. So um, uh, it's not – I would not call it a TPNI organization and I'm going to get to that in a minute. It's much broader than that. It's a <laughs> – I see looks of concern on some faces here. Um, but the main thing to know about it is that this is our one shot of really having some continuity in the peace movement on the organizational level. Otherwise, things just keep you know, reinventing and reinventing themselves. Okay. Now, there was some confusion also about parallel institutions and I think I didn't talk about it very much. So let me say a little bit more about it now. It's mentioned by George Lakey. Of course, that's who we get the step four should be step one motto. But the importance of parallel institutions is that if you build them strongly enough, it makes it immensely easier to get rid of the institutions to which they are parallels that you don't like. In other words, okay, the state let, – let's take the Palestinian example, the Israelis – Shut down Palestinian schools whenever they feel like it. So instead of saying, oh, you've shut us down, we're helpless, we have no school to go to, you start a little school in the basement of your house or in the back of the police station or wherever. And that's a parallel institution which you can immediately see it breaks <coughs> your dependence on the state. So the state or whatever is, is holding you down can no longer say, do what we want or we'll shut off your blah, blah. You say to them, go ahead, shut it off. We've got our own blah, blah, thank you. Uh, there's a – I don't know if any of you saw Riley, Ace of Spies. I don't know why we happened to pick this one television series to show at the ashram. But there's something about Riley that we liked. So there's a scene in Riley, Ace of Spies where Stalin is asking one of his henchmen about a particular group. And he's asking, what is this group doing? And the henchman says, oh, they have these meetings and they plan stuff. And uh, the benevolent dictator says, what sort of stuff do they plan? And he says, oh, well, <laughs> you know, they're sort of setting up a parallel government. You know, like a model UN. He says, kill them. And he has them all executed immediately because Stalin recognizes – and we should also from our point of view – that setting up a parallel institution immediately delegitimizes – the state or whoever it is had the original set and also breaks your dependency on them. And without that dependency, they have no hold on you unless it's a benevolent sort of institution that you've bought into in the first place. Unless it's the finest Congress that money can buy, for example, as Greg Palast has said. 
That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> um, there's a story from one of the great, great spiritual teachers in the 19th century uh, in India, Sri Ramakrishna, trying to explain how people can rapidly take to spiritual practice when it's the right time for them to do it and it's nearly impossible when it's not yet the right time. And he says, look at this palm tree. There are lots of palm trees in India. Here's this palm frond. It's been there for a while. You want to pull that frond off the palm tree, it's going to – ten strong men would not be able to do it. You know, it has all of these fibers running down into the trunk. It's on there. You cannot get it free. But the instant that a new green frond emerges, the old frond turns brown and drops away by itself. So that's the power of parallel institutions. And it's kind of the – what do we say? It's the, um, the jewel in the crown of constructive programs. And some of you thought that these were just institutions that sprang into existence uh, and, uh, and that they're just – they do these casual functions. No, you can build them. You can plan them and you can actually replace the government with your own government. That's, that's the power of it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep moving along unless I see a hand shoot up. The next is person power, the attribution. Blush. <laughs> this is my term. Uh, it's huh? – no, I invented Galtung. No. <laughs> no. Where is it? Actually, TPNI and person power are two items on your list that were part of a set. Some people thought that Hildegard Gossmeyer was part of a set with Jean Meyer, uh, namely that they're a married couple. <laughs> But that's not the kind of set that I meant. It's perfectly okay if you don't mention him. So that leaves us with person power and uh, TPNI, and I'll get to that in a minute. But person power is technically part of a set with people power and state power. People power, I don't know who came up with that phrase, but it's usually attached to the Philippine insurrection in 1986. It was coined as a contrast to an alternative to state power. And that's about as far as strategic nonviolence tends to go. And if you read uh, Jonathan Shell's new book, I can't remember the name of it, but he talks about the other, glo the other superpower, right? The world at this point in time, the poor world, has one superpower, which is a large country ly lying to the north of Mexico somewhere. But his point was there is another superpower, and that is the world's people. So what he has done is raised people power to the global level which is entirely appropriate. After spring break, we'll be talking about globalism and how nonviolence fits into it or tries not to. But here you have this polar opposition and I, a friend of mine, uh, Houston Smith, has often said the universe can count higher than two. And sometimes when you see polar oppositions, it shuts down large parts of reality. So I like to come in and break up polar oppositions and throw on a third item. Part of my self-designated job description. So I came up with person power, but while you're at it, it doesn't just break up the duality. Now, principled nonviolence accepts the existence of both of these, but it's primarily based on person power. And it is a form of power. Some of you were saying it's uh, you know, you talk about a single individual can be committed, which is true. And then you went on to say the importance of person power is if you can sum up a lot of person powers, you have people power. But my point is rather that all forms of power em ultimately emerge from person power, from the power of an individual. And you can look at it this way. When we were talking incidentally last semester about uh, mirror neurons and stuff, that is an example of how – we're picking up how person power gets generated in an individual. But look at it this way. The power of the state is very impressive 
But the minute enough people withdraw their assent from that power, it disappears. I mean, one day you know, Germany is divided into two countries. You have this huge wall. You will be shot instantly if you try and walk across that space of Checkpoint Charlie or, or wherever. And one day later, people are out there with crowbars pulling the thing down. You know, you, you with, you with Gene Sharp and the whole long tradition of political scientists that talks about withdrawal of consent, it's absolutely right as far as it goes. And it does mean that the power of the state can disappear overnight. People power, which is a collective power, kind of the effervescence of the crowd thing, it can also dissipate when the people disperse. I mean, look at this one of the most powerful – from various points of view, one of the most powerful episodes in the history of nonviolence is the Rosenstrasse prison demonstration. It lasted for one weekend, and by Monday morning there was nothing left. But person power is ineradicable. It is there. It's basically what keeps you alive, really, mobilized into a higher force and the love of your fellow beings and so forth. And as they say in the old song, die Gedanken sind frei. You know, you get to think what you want. You get to feel what you want. People can do things to your body, but they cannot, it's, they cannot get at person power. They can't change it. So in a way, I'm using this little stepwise thought process to illustrate that person power is fundamental uh, to the other types. Okay. Um, now, I think we, any questions about person power? Because this is really something that's quite – yeah, John? Is a, fast a fast is a way that a person is using his or her power. Yeah. It's using his or her hold on other people on various levels to, to create change yeah. and to manifest absolute independence from the system. Yeah. So if I would say a fast is an example. Or an implementation of the uh, inherent power in an individual. And I think the whole change in growth in understanding nonviolence in the last, oh, about 20 years has been uncovering person power, if you will. Okay, so the next was this uh, Tagalog expression, Ale Dangal. And Ale means to offer, and Dangal means dignity. And many of you remembered that, and that was very nice. Uh, <laughs> but there is something – a couple of other things could be said about it, and not everybody got them. One is – and I think I, f I made a fuss about this – that in the world's vocabulary about nonviolence, this is almost, almost the only positive term that I am aware of. I've taken a look at about 15 or 20 different words for nonviolence in different languages, and almost all of them attempt to be a literal translation of ahimsa, and they come out sounding negative in the respective language, which ahimsa did not actually do in Sanskrit. So, but to offer dignity is, is a rare positive expression. Um, for example, in Arabic, as far as I know, there are two terms that are current and uh, Ahmed isn't here today. You heard about Ahmed going to L.A., Marcella? Okay. Uh, Ahmed isn't here, but uh, there's a term le'uf, which means nonviolence, but they also use the term sumud or patience, endurance, something like that. So uh, Alay Dangal is rare, positive term for nonviolence and we should be very happy about that, celebrate it, put it in our midterms, identify it correctly, and so forth. The other thing to be said about it is this question of dignity is – for Gandhi, it was just primary and often we overlook it. We overlook it when we insult people whose minds we are trying to change if we're even trying to change their minds as opposed to just make them feel bad. But uh, I remember having this discussion with Dan Ellsberg. It's, it's the second or third famous name I've dropped so far this morning. Let's see how many we can rack up. Uh, he 
he, you know, the peace movement was all – even in the free speech movement, for example, <laughs> people would get up and, and, and use their free speech to say insulting things about, say, a dean or an administrator. Not realizing that when you bring down the dignity of another person, you compromise your own. Not realizing now on the strategic level that when you do that, you alienate that person in the most effective way that you can possibly do that. Uh, Carol Gilligan is another famous name. She, she's part of a set with Harold Gilligan. <laughs> Harold Gilligan is a psychiatrist who has studied really, really violent criminals, serial killers and stuff like that, the kind of people that Marshall Rosenberg had to talk to in that little story. Did I tell you that story? I'm going, yeah, talking to this person who killed seven people. Yeah, last semester. Okay, well, I'll get around to it when we talk about something else. But uh, Gilligan, as a psychiatrist, has studied these people for two decades, came to the conclusion that the one most effective predictor of violent behavior is the lack of dignity with which one was treated in one's youth. So this is very powerful on the strategic level and on the principal level. It's very deeply healing and that's why I think that the Filipino people did a really smart thing in latching onto this concept. It hasn't stuck and maybe that should be your project <laughs> when you go back there from the Ale Dangal radio station or something like that. <laughs> oh. I don't know which – what books he has written, but his name is Gilligan, Harold Gilligan. Yeah. Can you write that yeah. I'll have to do it in English though if that's okay with you. Le'uf means nonviolence and sumud means patience or endurance. Which is pretty good, but uh, you know, you could be enduringly bad also. So <laughs> there's no way you can offer a person bad dignity. But uh, endurance by itself is like close to, but not exactly at the center. Thanks. Okay, we're getting, around, getting along very well. Uh, TPNI is part of a set. That's another one of our set terms. And what is it a set with and why? Remember that? CBD, Civilian Based Defense and Third Party Nonviolent Intervention. And what are they a set of? What, what, are, what are these two things? What do they do for us? Sorry, Catherine? Um, I would say that TPNI tends to be more based on people power, but CBD often requires like the whole population to resist as one. And so they haven't focused on uh, people power there. Adriana? Exactly. This, I this is the way that nonviolence can respond to the biggest, most destructive and most highly organized and most enduring form of violent conflict, which is armed conflict or war. So here's, here's our answer. It comes in these two forms. What's the difference between CPNI and CBD? How do, can you tell which one you're dealing with? I'd like you guys to be so intimately familiar with this that if your roommate wakes you up in the middle of the night, you would be able to answer. Amy and then Matthias. Yeah, like duh. <laughs> All right. Yes, CBD is a do-it-yourself method and TPNI is do it for other people. That's basically the difference. Uh, CBD typically is deployed – well, typically is deployed in probably about six cases in all of human history, but typically deployed in advance of an attack, uh, a wholesale attack on a country. Whereas third-party nonviolent intervention could be almost at any stage of the development of a conflict. Matthias, did you want to add something? Okay. Yeah, yeah the, the classic example of CBD is Prague Spring. Yeah. 
Yeah, the whole society had to do it. I mean, if, it, if small, isolated groups of individuals decide to resist an armed invasion, they will typically just be uh, – what's the term we use? They'll be taken out. They'll be taken out. They'll just be killed. But when you have a whole population, say, the, in Prague what happened was they would declare a curfew. Say, 8 o'clock, everybody off the streets. At 8 o'clock, every door in Prague would open up. And these are beautiful doors, by the way, if you've ever seen Prague or seen a poster, the doors of Prague. And Prague actually means doorway. I just found that out last weekend, so I thought I would share that with you. Uh, every door in this town would fly open and everybody would be out on the streets. Now, obviously, you can defy a curfew if you're just an isolated person, but it's – you're very likely to get yourself killed that way. Women have been doing it in Palestine. They've been going out saying, this is my time to do my shopping and I don't care what the IDF says. They go out and do it. And you, uh, usually they have been joined by other people. But CBD does depend more or less on the whole population saying, no, we, we don't accept this thing. Therefore, it doesn't exist. So you're talking about state power and threat power, okay? If we don't obey you, you don't have any state power over us. If we don't, aren't scared of your threats, your threat power doesn't work. So that's how they, you knock that out. So there was another thing I want to say about TP and I and the way you, you were responding to it. And that is that this is typical for a lot of our terms is you, y if you're not familiar with them or you're just getting familiar with them, you tend to use them in way too general a way. And that is going to make it – we're going to lose focus that way and we won't know what we're talking about. So let's confine TPNI – I mean this is one of the reasons we gave it an acronym, right? So it could be a specific focus thing that we're talking about as a deliberate intervention by a third party, distinctly a third party from outside the area, the regime, the culture, in order to in some way break up the conflict process and create a space for dialogue and peace. Therefore, I would not say as some of you did – and I don't think I took off a point for this because we hadn't quite discussed it – I would not say that Hildegard Gostmeier's presence in Manila in the mid-80s was an example of third-party nonviolent intervention. She was a third party to be sure. She was very helpful. But she – I'm trying to get my hands on what exactly is different here. First of all, she wasn't a group. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, I like that, John. Let's <laughs> what, I, what I was going to say <coughs> – is that uh, she wasn't really a third party. She did not attempt to negotiate anything between Marcos and the Philippine people. She was there for the Philippine people. That probably is the very best way to look at it, look at the difference. But the other thing that I was going to say, which is not nearly as exciting, is that she confined herself to uh, encouragement and education, which TPNI – that's almost the last thing they get around to. What they, they try to do direct interventions of one kind or another. Like this classic thing that happened in Sri Lanka about a year and a half ago where some children had been abducted uh, to be uh, made, in, made into soldiers by a faction of the Tamil Tigers. The mothers of those children, those boys, knew exactly where they were and wanted to go get them, but they were afraid. So they called on our uh, team and I think two of our people went and accompanied those mothers to the Tamil Tiger camp and then just stood outside the door and let the mothers go in and do the negotiating. See, they did not act as mediators. They acted as protectors, witnesses. At the end of the day, literally, the, uh, the Tigers came out with those mothers, gave them back their children and gave them their bus fare to go back to town. So that is an interaction that could not have happened without the intervention of a third party. So t the potential for TPNI is that if you build it up on a larger scale – that's what David Hartso was telling us about – that it could really become a visible substitute for the war system. Okay? So let's keep that in focus. Then uh, the next one was radical pacifism. 
The reason that I wanted us to learn something about this movement is that it was a transition from the days of political ra radicalism to the days of nonviolent resistance. So up until roughly World War II, the struggle – it's the same struggle but it's getting reconceptualized. The struggle was conceptualized as basically a class struggle which meant basically a labor struggle which meant basically if you wanted to be progressive, you would seriously consider joining the Communist Party. And until unless you find out what Stalin was doing in the Soviet Union, you might well have a very idealistic commitment to communism or anarchism or something like that. Now my, my way of looking at it is that that was not nearly revolutionary enough because it, did, it was still accepting materialism and still accepting violence. So really it wasn't going to get us enough, not get us far enough. Radical pacifism begins to refocus on different kinds of victimization and it looks at uh, ethnic minorities, intolerance and things like that and begins to discover nonviolent resistance as a tactic. And that leads us up to the future. So what you wanted to say about radical pacifism was that it grew out of the World War II conscientious objector phenomenon that a lot of you just stopped there. But if you, if you remember, you had that one page in your reader which I drew your attention to which kind of lays out very succinctly what were the characteristics of radical pacifism and how it was a transition from the old Marxist class struggle days to whatever it is we're trying to do today save the oaks or whatever it may be. Okay. Now we move on to Atpur and I, I have to apologize. I got carried away. There was effervescence of the individual happened and I gave it an exclamation point just because I was so enthusiastic. But technically it does not have an exclamation point. I didn't take off any credits for this. Uh, Earth First is the only organization that actually has an exclamation point as part of its title to my knowledge. Um, there was only one thing that a lot of you failed to mention about Atpur. And again, it's the thing that is most characteristic, is almost qualitatively different about it. And that is that it was the only example of a nonviolent movement being funded by the United States government. <laughs> The revolution of 1776 was not nonviolent. Though people have argued that there was a nonviolent movement going on. If they had let it go, we would have had a much more bloodless, much more efficient, and much better revolution. But be that as it may, it's this Atpur was supported by outside intervention which focused on training and education. So th this was rare on a large scale. You had a huge social uprising which was supported by educational materials coming directly from the Center for S Study of Nonviolence Sanctions in Conflict and Defense whew, at Harvard, the, the Gene Sharp people. So that's the input. The output side is that after the revolution succeeded, they parlayed that into this organization Council Nonviolent Action and con something like – C-A-N-V-A-S. I forget exactly what it stands for. But what they've done is try to package the experience of the Atpur students and make it available to other revolutions. It has been very successful. There's about eight other uprisings that have happened that probably either would not have happened or would not have been nearly as successful without that input. So I keep jumping up and down and making a big fuss about this. I know that it's much more appealing to talk about action and things like that. But I want action to work, darn it. I want it to be effective and efficient. And that's where the power of thinking and conceptualization comes in. That's the part that we have done least well at. <coughs> And we'll look at this phenomenon, for example. We're experiencing this uh, neoconservative takeover, uh, I mean, uh, movement. 
And uh, where did it come from? Well, partly it came from the fact that foundations – so you would think – this is a result of a very interesting study – you would think that uh, progressive foundations have a lot less money than conservative or reactionary foundations. That turns out to be only partly true. Actually, there's a pretty decent amount of money out there for good causes even if you're not counting George Soros and Bill Gates working on HIV in Africa and so forth. There's a decent amount of money. But for some reason – and it has to do with culture, I believe – the people who were funding progressive causes were very timid about it. And they never funded anybody more than three years, which means that you didn't get a chance to develop anything. They never funded infrastructure, which is what we needed most. And as a friend of mine who was a funder, I went to her one day and said, Susan, I have a great idea. And she said, we do not fund ideas. So what do they fund? Everything that I don't need. So, and while all this is going on on the progressive side, conservatives were focusing their support on key individuals with good ideas and maintaining that support as long as it took to get those ideas into practice. So the result of that is you have this network of right-wing think tanks and they are able to come up with a concerted strategy and the rest is this dismal situation that we happen to be suffering through right now. Whereas in the progressive world, we've been saying, oh, you know, we already know what we need. There's no need to discuss it. Certainly no need to talk it over with anybody else because they're way too stupid. And uh, why? what do we need a think tank for? And as a result, we don't have a strategy, we don't have a plan. All we've got is George Lakoff, which you know is pretty good, but it may not be quite enough. Um, so that's my excuse for constantly fussing so much about the component of the social change that's trying to happen, which deals with how we understand and think about and, and uh, interpret and discuss our ideas. Okay. Any, anything I've said so far that's like particularly annoying or do you think we should – anything else? Okay. Uh, the last remaining item is not an item but a person. is Hildegard Gossmeyer. She's an example, again, of continuity. <laughs> will, will you guys figure out who owns which of those two laptops? <laughs> okay. That's okay, John. I understand. I, I, I have technical problems myself. I know how that is. Um, uh, it's good to – some of you, when you were talking about Hildegard Gus Meyer, you went immediately to the People's Power Revolution and just talked about that. That was only part of her career. And you should know that she's a very good writer and that she's, she's still at work, that she's an honorary president of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, and that she also worked in Guatemala. And she's like a roving trainer ambassador. Just at, up until recently, it's been a very small group of people who've been playing that role, and she's been one of the most prominent ones. All right. So I want to say a little bit then about the essays, and then we can move on to have a look at this video, I hope. Uh, if you wrote about restorative justice, you might have seen the following cryptic – or you may see – you may see this written at the end of your essay. Okay. So, okay, what is NZ? And this is not a trick question. It's New Zealand and it's – why is it here in connection with restorative justice? It's been a model for uh, war programs. Yeah. Right. It, it is a model of taking indigenous formats for uh, restorative justice and incorporating them into a modern state. So New, okay. New Zealand is way ahead in this regard. Is that kind of like a I'm not – does anybody know about – oh, okay. In the parliament, yeah. There's a lot of cool things uh, about New Zealand, uh, not the least of which is the scenery. Uh, if any of you saw the whale rider, 
That is a wonderful movie. I'd really strongly recommend that. That's, that's the interface between ancient and modern New Zealand. I didn't talk much about restorative justice <laughs> in that movie, mostly about whacking people with sticks and riding around on wheels. <laughs> but New Zealand is one example among many. In my book, I talked about Navajo examples that have been brought in. And uh, there's an interesting parallel here in Navajo medicine. If you are riding a horse on a Navajo reservation and you are a, a dude and can't stay on your mount and fall off and break your leg, they will immediately take you to a Western hospital to get your leg set because they do not have x-ray machines on the reservation and they don't know how to do that. But as soon as you get your leg taken care of, they'll bring you back to the medicine man and they'll start working on you to take care of the trauma that you experience in your mind and body when this thing happened to you. That the Western doctors are absolutely clueless about that. You're even mentioning it is enough to get you thrown out of medical school. So <laughs> this is very typical of a big fact about our contemporary world and that is that we need each other. We need indigenous wisdom and modern invention inventiveness. And so similarly in restorative justice, bringing indigenous methods in and articulating them with the needs of a modern industrial society is a very good move. Now VORP, uh, this wasn't in anything I said in lecture but it is in my book. It stands for Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. I mean, that's that kind of format where you bring the victim and the offender together with uh, some sort of mediation. And you work out a system where they can feel good about one another. Oh, that's too bad. I have an article on restorative justice and I left it in my office and I'm not going to send Amy running all the way up to Stevens Hall to get it at this point. Um, this, it's a nice article. I'll bring it in after spring break and read you a few things about it. One of the things that this writer said is that the retributive justice, the worst thing that it does is it isolates both the victim and the offender from the internal impact of their experience. It turns it into an abstract thing. Don't worry, the state will take care of you. We'll distribute punishment and there will be justice. It has really almost nothing to do with your feelings. Now we keep constantly trying to pretend and deny that this isn't the case. And every time we execute someone, we bring the family of the victim and the journalist goes around to this family and waits until you get somebody who says, oh, thank you. I feel so much better. This is closure. You know, when I saw the smoke coming out of his ears, I really felt that at last, you know. And, but this is absolute nonsense. This is not how human beings react at all. And, but the journalist playing their role in sustaining the culture, true or false, mostly false, are constantly iterating this every time there's an execution because this is part of trying to convince us that retributive justice works. But it does not work. It isolates the individual from his or her own experiences. So restorative justice goes right back to that level and says this is the key thing. Let's fix it for the victim and for the offender. And another program that works within restorative justice is called the Alternatives to Violence Project. Mostly a Quaker-based program goes into prisons. And one of the simple things it does is it takes cons, convicts and teaches them how to talk about their issues so they can solve it on the level of talking without you know, pulling a knife on one another. And in other ways too, it tries to give them some self-esteem. There's our dignity thing again. Uh, and once again, it's completely non-governmental, but here and there, more progressive criminal justice units have taken to adopting some of these things into their prison because they see how well it works. And incidentally, our very own state, California, tried to do this. Uh, this took this prison warden, Joanne Woodruff, I think her name was, who was an incredible human being, who was uh, – always thinking about the inmates as people, had a, an amazing record in terms of the people that she released did not come back to prison. And none other than Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger picked up on this 
and he appointed her to be the head of the Justice Department of California, in which position she lasted for about three and a half weeks because the prisoners, prison guards union is so immensely powerful that nobody at this point can function in that whole system. So that just gives you an example of some of the problems we were up against in instituting this. And uh, again, it shows that restorative justice has been pretty much a constructive program operation without an obstructive program element. Um, okay, I have only one other supplement to make here. That is, those of you who discussed Larzac, that campaign, and quite a few of you did for obvious reasons, important to mention the power of the community. It, uh, what the community does, and I myself didn't realize this until just now, what the community does, therefore you were, not <laughs> you were not responsible for it. But I'm kind of thrilled, so I'm going to share it with you. Okay, nonviolence up to now has been mostly an idea which shows up in occasional episodes. But that doesn't give it much solidity for most of us who are pretty much anchored in the material world. If you take this idea of nonviolence and make it into a community, that gives it much more local habitation and a name, as we say in English poetry. It reifies it. It makes it a thing. So I mentioned several strategic advantages of the communities that Gandhi founded in India, that they were like refuges. They were mostly training centers and they were places where you could experiment with a new economy and a new way of living. But I think the most important aspect of community, like the community of the Ark, is that it shows you you could build a whole world based on nonviolence. We're doing it right here on our small scale. This is what monasteries were in the Middle Ages. They created another world based on a different energy and they showed you that another world was possible. Okay. So I don't mean to give you the impression that your exams were very weak. Actually, they were basically they were quite good. And uh, let me just again remind you that if they were very, very good, you're probably in trouble. <laughs> if they were very bad, you're also in trouble. In the latter case, come and talk to me. But otherwise, they were pretty good. So let's now – have we got – yeah. Okay. We, uh, let's see now if we're going to get this thing to work. Oh, there's something. Uh -huh. well, that's that's your that's your notes for your exam. <laughs> I hope you didn't carry that with you into the. Anyway, uh, Casey, would you get the lights for us, please? There we go. Uh, Judy Barry and her partner were driving in a car and a bomb uh, – there was a bomb in the car. And she, within five minutes, the FBI came around and arrested her for having bombed herself. And uh, uh, it was horrendous and it looked like a very good case was actually developing uh, against the FBI. Unfortunately, Judy, possibly partly as a result of complications, of this uh, attack, she developed cancer and uh, she died uh, shortly thereafter. But they're just before the Oakland police and the FBI were going to be brought to court and publicly accused of uh, counterterrorism uh, for having bombed her. 
But that's, that's a very unfortunate outcome. wasn't the part of the film that I mainly wanted to focus on. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two comments and then I want to stop so you can have time to pick up your exams. Anything that – I hope you were able to hear that, by the way. I don't know why the sound wasn't that good. Let's – oh, the, yeah, this is a contraband DVD, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> So. Anybody want to just comment on this from any aspect at all? You, what stood out for you? Sam? Um, well, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, I do know that it, it's, it's far from over. It's still going on, but I think uh, Mr. Hurwitz, the, the junk bond king who moved in and milked uh, the remaining redwoods. I think he's now out of the picture one way or the other. But that would be very interesting to find out actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else strike you? Michael? Well, th this is uh, – I'm, I'm starting to come up with some kind of a concept around this. Yeah, that's my job. I come up with concepts. For things that are already in existence. But there's something about uh, clarity uh, that if – as long as the issue can be confused and polarized, we don't get anywhere. And the closer we get to focusing the issue on what it really is, the more power uh, we gain from that clarity. So as long as they were pretending that everybody wants to clear cut and it's good for everybody, uh, it was impossible for the environmentalists to get anywhere because they were, you know, isolated and stigmatized in that way. But what they were able to do is show that really nobody benefits from this in any substantial way. Uh, that we're an interconnected system. When we go beyond the kind of sustainable harvesting that uh, Zachary Running Wolf was talking about last time and we start cutting into the – Capital instead of living off the interest of nature. That's the concept that E.F. Schumacher came up with. It's very limited how long we can survive at that. It's, it's kind of like that line between poverty and destitution. We're running nature down to a state of destitution. And that hurts everybody. So this is perhaps the one area where conservatives and progressives are starting to identify some commonality in our world today is around the environment. So a, a concept that will not unlikely show up on the final exam is this idea of monkey wrenching, um, which is a general term for property destruction or in a, any, some other way interfering with uh, something that you don't like, which doesn't involve getting to the people. So I think with that, I'll stop unless you have any other – we have time for another question or two if you've got one comment or two. Okay, good. So let that sink in and let's let's not all crowd up here at once. This isn't like a uh, one-day sale.